Good morning, everybody. This is one of those places I can go in the world where I can say Merry Christmas, and no one will tell me I can't say that. Are you going to tell me I can't say Merry Christmas? No. Merry Christmas to you all. Uh, it is the 19th of December, or, well, it's actually the 18th, and I know that um, some of our families have already headed home uh, or other places for the holidays, and some guests are now arriving. Uh, next week, just so you know, from what I understand, there will be no Sabbath, children's Sabbath schools classes at 10, but there will be a gathering of saints at our normal worship time, which is just a little bit after 11, okay? This morning, I don't have much to tell you except that uh, today our young people are going to be doing almost everything, 90%. Um, and um, I, what I need to say is um, Carl is going to start the live stream. As a matter of fact, if he hasn't started it already, he can. Um, and we are going to do some public domain stuff. Uh, a story is going to be read. Some songs are going to be sung. Some videos are going to be played. We have streaming rights to all the content we are live streaming today. Did that get captured on the live stream, Carl? All right, that's all I needed to announce. Without further ado, we will proceed with a little bit of a Christmas celebration of music and stories.
Welcome and happy Sabbath, everyone. I am so glad to be here with all you guys, especially in this beautiful, wonderful Christmas season. Um, the, we're going to do two songs and then a little break and then two more songs. And so please stand with us for the first song, Go Tell It on the Mountain.
and wonders of your love. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down. A long time ago, on top of a hill overlooking a village in far-off England, there lived a lonely old farmer. Now, it must be said that the old farmer hadn't always been lonely. He hadn't always been old, and in fact, there had been a time in his younger years that his humble farm had been filled with the laughter of children and the voice of a loving wife. Back then, the old farmer's wife would often chase the squealing children around the yard at sunset while the old farmer finished his labors and set supper on the table, smiling as he listened to the sounds of their joy. The, the family would gather around the big oak table for supper and story time. The old farmer and his wife would captivate their children with tales of love and bravery. Then the family would lie down to sleep for the night their stomachs filled with food and their dreams filled with courageous characters. But all that was gone now. The old farmer's wife had passed from a tragic illness many years ago. His children had all grown and moved away, and all that remained were the memories of a happier time. Each night, after finishing the last of his chores, the old man would perch himself on his broken down fence and gaze down at the twinkling lights of the frosty village. Hundreds of flickering lights from the shops and homes would wink back at him like old friends through the blackness of the night. Occasionally, the sound of a dog barking in the distance would disturb the silence. At other times, quiet conversations of families enjoying a final exchange before churning in for the night would escape into the cold night air and fill the old farmer's heart with warm memories of days gone by. And for that one brief moment, Enveloped by the familiar lights and sounds of the village, he would forget his loneliness. Night after night, the old farmer would remain fixed at his spot on the hill until every light of the village had gone out. First, one light would disappear, followed by another, then another. Finally, the light on the church steeple would be the last light of the village, shining triumphantly against the night sky. And then it, too, would go out putting the village to bed beneath a blanket of darkness. One chilly morning, the old farmer made his way into town to pay a visit to the village cobbler. His favorite boots had been worn thin, and they were in great need of repair. As the old farmer entered the shop, the cobbler lifted a silencing hand and motioned for the farmer to listen to the nearby radio. As he did, a somber voice on the radio declared, This country is at war with Germany. For a brief moment, the cobbler and the old farmer didn't say a word. 
instead exchanging grave looks of concern. Whatever are we to do? The cobbler finally exclaimed as he cradled his head in his hands. The voice on the radio continued to warn that German warplanes would soon begin their bombing raids over towns and villages of England. And the more the old farmer listened, the heavier his heart grew. News that the war had reached the shores of his beloved homeland made him very sad indeed. Over the next few days, the villagers were taught what they needed to do to protect their village. They were told to hang thick black curtains in every window of every home in order to block out all light that might be seen by enemy planes. The mayor ordered that all street lights and lamps be extinguished. All throughout the village, people could be seen nervously scurrying about, preparing their homes and neighborhoods. Windows were blacked out, and bulbs of every size and shape were removed from street lamps. The discarded light bulbs were then put into wooden crates that had been placed in the streets throughout the village. Wishing to do his part, the old farmer pushed his wooden cart through the narrow streets of the village to gather up the lights, feeling that in doing so, he was gathering up old friends. He sadly filled his cart with crates full of lights and then pulled his cart up the snow-packed hills to his farm. One by one, he lifted the crates out of his car and carefully placed them in the corner of his barn. There, he felt they would be safe until the war was over and they could once again light up his village. Do you ever wonder why when Mary and Joseph got to Bethlehem, there was no room for them? Maybe they forgot their reservations. Maybe they forgot to put their Airbnb reservation in. But I think part of it is that God wanted Jesus to be accessible to us, to be born in a manger, a lowly manger. And there was no room for him because that's because there was room in our hearts to be able to receive him. And so as we sing the song, What Child Is This? I hope that uh, this time of the season is not just you know, important for um, the time that we have together and to be able to celebrate Jesus' birth. But I hope that you will renew your commitment to Jesus and allow him to come and penetrate into your heart. Sing with us, What Child Is This? Yeah. 
shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him blood, the babe, the son of Mary. Nail, spear shall pierce him through the cross he The story of the next song, Silent Night, many of you probably know it, but a priest got together with an organist of the church, and apparently the organ was broke that day, and so they played that song uh, with guitar with a choir on the debut, and from that moment it became one of the most popular Christmas songs ever. And to this day, I think Bing Crosby's version is still the number one Christmas song of all time. Please join with us as we sing Silent Night.
As the days and weeks passed by, the Christmas season quietly approached. The village, which at this time of year was typically aglow with beautiful lights and sounds of Christmas, was instead shrouded over with the dark veil of war. The old farmer had long ago stopped sitting at the post of his fence at night because there was nothing to see. All the lights that had once beamed up at him so brightly were now hidden away in fear. Instead, the old man would go to bed each night feeling a little bit lonelier than he had the night before. One night, as the old farmer finished his chores and leaned his shovel against the wall of his barn before heading to bed, he caught sight of the crates of lights. It seemed so long ago that they had lit up the village. Oh, how he missed them. After the farmer had crawled into bed that night and was just about ready to drift off to sleep, a tiny idea popped into his head. The more he thought about it, the more certain he became that this was exactly what he needed to do. Yes, he said to himself, whispering even though no one was in his quiet home to overhear him. With a small smile and a new sense of purpose, he fell into a deep and peaceful slumber. As Christmas Eve arrived and the nightly darkness once more settled over the village, the villagers, who should have been waiting and listening for St. Nick, were instead greeted with the unsettling buzz of approaching enemy planes. Before too long, the loud thunder of exploding bombs in distant villages shook the ground under their feet, sending them scurrying for cover. Closer and closer the planes came, until suddenly their screaming engines could be heard just overhead. Frightened, the people of the village huddled together with their families in their darkened homes and shelters. The noise of the circling planes above the village was deafening. Silently, they waited as plane after plane flew over their village. Finally, after what seemed like hours, a quiet silence settled over the village as the very last of the planes roared off into the distance. When the villagers were absolutely sure that their planes were really gone and that it was finally safe to come out, they cautiously filed out into the cold night. As they gathered in the village streets, one young boy noticed an unfamiliar glow coming from the hill where the old farmer lived. What's that, he cried, pointing up at the hill. When the people of the village turned to look at where the young boy was pointing, their eyes were met with the glorious sight, for there on the hill beneath the old farmer's barn were strings and strings of lights in every shape and size, spelling out a brilliant message for all to see. Yes, peace, peace on earth, some of the villagers whispered to each other as they gazed upon the heavenly sight, their eyes shining with light. Never had the lights of Christmas meant so much to the people of the village as they did in that very moment. And it must be said that, nev that never had the lights of the village meant so very much to the old farmer, who, by the way, was no longer lonely. I told Chrissy we'd be done by noon. I was wrong. That story that was just read to you, um, I bought it in Costco this year. And I want to give a little attribution to the author because I figured that he and the illustrator, she, wouldn't mind uh, us using it in church if I told you that it's for sale on Amazon. And um, I, I thought about it as I, as I was reading that story, what an incredible opportunity was missed at the end of the story. There's a story about how at Christmas there's no light, and then suddenly there's light. And what a great opportunity that would be to, in some way, equate that to the birth of Christ, Right? 
Um, to me, that is the most beautiful thing about the birth of Christ, is the story of light coming into the world. It's no wonder that when a date was chosen to celebrate the birth of Christ, the darkest time of the year was chosen, right? It was, it's the time of year when we all hit the bottom and just the days start getting longer after that. The light starts coming back into the world. I was thinking about it this week, um, just by sheer random occurrence, Thursday night I was at a Christmas party in a place called Holton, Maine. Does anybody know where Holton, Maine is? You do? All right. It's about as far as you can go in America on I-95 before you hit Canada. And uh, that's where our, our, one of our offices is, and uh, those folks don't get, um, to, they, they don't get parties uh, thrown in their honor very often, so we were having a party for them. And uh, the party, of course, was going to run until the last people left, and then I had to get from there to Bangor, Maine to, fly, to start flying home, and my flight was at 5 a.m. So I, I, I started driving toward Bangor from Holton about... Uh, one in the morning, and we weren't actually in Holton, and so I wasn't taking I-95, I was taking country roads in Maine. And there were no, there are no streetlights. It's just a two-lane road, and the only thing that you see, other than the speed limit signs, are these signs that say, beware frequent moose crossing. And you think, yeah, I really would like to drive faster, but... I don't dare take the risk. And so there I was, puttering along this road at a, at a safe speed in, the, in absolute darkness. And I just remember, every once in a while, I would come to a crossing. Nothing more. You couldn't describe it as anything more than a crossing. There'd be a couple farmhouses there, maybe a convenience store. By that time of night, long shut down. And I just remember what a wonderful thing it was if when you came to one of those little crossings, Somebody had decorated their house for Christmas because it was like just stark contrast. It was a beautiful, beautiful light. You know, I didn't care if it was Frosty the Snowman or St. Nick on the roof. It didn't matter. I was just ecstatic to see that one point of light in the darkness because I was so tired. And that kept me awake and it kept me going. I was reminded as I was driving through there of, here's an expression that will date you in cultural America if you know it. How many of you have heard the expression, a thousand points of light? How many of you know who you heard it from? I hear George Bush, good, good. It was actually used first in a science fiction novel by Arthur C. Clarke, but George Bush made it much more famous. And George Bush, uh, George H.W. Bush, the first George Bush president, he um, was using it to say, we want to create an America where there are, th- there are thousands of points of light, charities and just well-intentioned Americans who are there to help each other out. And we want to create a government that helps those points of light appear and arise. And I remember thinking at the time that that was a little bit of a cop-out, because wouldn't it be great if we could somehow talk about the fact that America as a whole was a giant beacon of light, right? That we had to kind of We have to kind of say, well, you know, maybe if we can't be a giant beacon of light, we at least can have thousands of little points of light. And that's kind of the way I felt as I was driving down this road um, at night, just waiting for the next point of light, waiting for the next next beacon. And it reminded me of, um, to me, the best version of the Christmas story. Uh, And we're going to talk about it. But we've been talking in Next Gen about the difference between the stories, the Christmas stories in Luke and in Matthew, and why Matthew's was written the way his was. He was writing to the Jews. He was telling them that the king had come, the Messiah had come. He was emphasizing the fact that kings came to worship him and that he was descended from kings. And then Luke is writing to the rest of the world saying, yeah, Jesus was for the rest of you too, including shepherds. 
But to me, my favorite version of the gospel story is in John. And this one you know very well. We could probably recite it together in different versions of the Bible. But I want to talk about it briefly, and I'm just going to use the New International Version. And the best version of the Christmas story starts off like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, if you have had a chance to watch The Chosen, the Bible kind of dramatization series that's taking the world by storm right now, at the very beginning of season two, you don't know at first what you're seeing, but what you find out is you're seeing John, the apostle, sitting at a dark table trying to decide how to write the story of Jesus. And then you have Mary, the mother of Jesus, counseling him. And, 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 and they arrive on this theme of, you know, John is saying, this is what I want to say. Other things have already been said, but this is what I want to say. And they arrive on this theme of truth and light coming into the world. But I love the way he wrote this because you can almost tell that he knew he was writing something so mystical that it was just going to be hard to understand for the human mind to comprehend. Because after he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, he almost says, yeah, I need to stop and emphasize that. He was with God in the beginning. I just got to make sure you heard that right. And then he says, he does the same thing in the next passage. He says, through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. It's almost like, through him, all things were made. Semicolon. Good use of a semicolon, right, Miss Cindy? Semicolon. I got to emphasize that. I got to say it a different way so you understand it. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Nothing. Nothing. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That's the New International Version. There uh, in, in, in uh, the, I think it's the American Standard. There's a couple different versions. The, book, the New International Version chooses to make that a conflict verb, right? That the, light, the darkness has not overcome it. Other versions say the darkness could not comprehend it, didn't understand it. And then, I'll read quickly through the rest. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. John just keeps saying, look, i gotta, I got to make sure you understand this. John wasn't the light. He was just the witness to the light. The true light that gives light to, to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Once again, didn't comprehend. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet of all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Children born not of natural descent, or, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh, made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And I'm going to skip a parenthesis verse 15. Um, Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And here, here he ends in the next verse. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father who has made him known. In the, I believe it's the American Standard Version, where in this version it says, is in closest relationship with the Father. I think it's the American Standard Version that says, he is in the arms of the Father. He is in the arms of the Father. And to me, that's the best version of the, uh, the gospel story, is this, this story that at a dark time, and this earth has seen plenty of dark times, 
The light came into the world, and it says, the light was the life of men. And as you go out today, 10 minutes afternoon, a little bit later than I promised Chrissy, as you go out today, I want to read you the rest of that story from the Bible, from Isaiah 60. Because now that we have received the light, John says very clearly, we have a choice to either understand it and comprehend it or not. And he talks about the grace and the things that come with it. If we we can comprehend it, if we can understand what was done on Christmas Day. But in Isaiah, in chapter 60, if you have your, you know, you can... They should make Bible Gateway make a sound of pages turning when you swipe. That way it would feel like you had a good old-fashioned Bible. In Isaiah 60, Isaiah is prophesying about the coming of Jesus, and he says this. And this is kind of the calling for those who understand the light. Isaiah says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth. And thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light. And kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look about you. All assemble and come to you. Your sons come from afar and your daughters are carried on the hip. Then you will look and be radiant, light, radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth on the seas will be brought to you and the riches of the nations will come. There's a calling in Isaiah that says, you, your light has come and has dawned on you. And you now reflect that glory to everyone else. Light has come. You are called to be light. I want to pray for you today, and then I'm going to ask one of the guys in the back, after I'm done praying, to just hit the down arrow on my laptop. And uh, we'll have a, I have a little video that um, the Mormon church did for us, and I think it's a beautiful one. But let's pray today. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you've been in our presence the whole time. We are grateful that, um, that you have never left us. You are in the arms of the Father. You're the only one who has seen the Father. And you left that to come here. And when you left, you, you gave us a comforter so that we, you would have never, it would be as if you never left. Lord, we are grateful for the light At this time of year, it is actually a joy to contemplate darkness just so that we understand the importance of light, the importance of the gift that you gave to this world. Please make us a people, help us be a people that comprehend you, that comprehend the light, and send us out of this place to be the light of the world. We ask this in your name, amen.
I wish you all the blessings of Christmas. Whatever understanding you are gifted by the Lord to, uh, to carry into Christmas, to carry through Christmas, I, I, I wish every blessing on you. And if there are any of you today that need a place to have lunch, we have lunch downstairs for you. Actually, needs too strong a word. Wants good enough. So uh, I dismiss you with the blessings of the Lord this morning for the Christmas season. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>